I wonder if, a long time ago, when contemplating the fact that a church service might be asking this question, what the world needs most, and I wonder if those most learned and holy early church leaders who invented the season, the observance of Advent, I wonder if they ever envisioned that a church like us and a pastor like me would pick out a song like that and start off a sermon by saying, don't you agree with the goo-goo dolls uh, in church? Um, uh, this really is where we find ourselves this Christmas. I agree. I just want better days for Christmas. I don't need empty things wrapped up. None of us do in our culture this year. What does the world need most in order to have better days? Luke 2 verse 10 and 11 is the crux of the story tonight. And the angel said to them, be not afraid for behold, I bring you good news of a great joy which will come to all people. For to you is born this day a Savior who is Christ the Lord. What does the world need now? Especially after the dark events in our country this month. Do we need more beauty and goodness? Yes, we do. We need more of it. And on Christmas Eve, we're in a heightened state of awareness of things that are good and things that are beautiful in our lives and in our world. And so, yeah, I mean, we need more beauty and goodness. Like, I mean, the wonder that is the voice of a child. I just love the simple moment of hearing the children sing uh, away in a manger. The beauty of Christmas lights. I found myself this December um, walking out into my cul-de-sac before I go to bed almost every night in my pajamas. Um, none of you live there, so you can't catch me at this. And just looking at the lights of my house, of houses around us, and then looking up through the bare branches of the crepe myrtle in our front yard at the stars, at the moon, and in wonder at the beauty of this creation, the beauty of the flame of one of these candles. And this church, we've witnessed the goodness that we find even in people in this last year. We've seen incredible generosity just among ourselves in this congregation uh, for those who are down and out. If you have eyes to see the goodness in this world is palpable, you can reach out and touch it. And this goodness comes from God, whose nature is good, who saw fit to share the goodness of mere existence and consciousness with us. But in spite of this goodness, we all know that something else is needed. Something else is needed more for better days this Christmas. What do we need most? We went out in the community here in Lake Norman, and we asked this question this year. What do we need most in the world this year? Let's see what Lake Norman people said. What does the world need now? Happiness, peace, and understanding of everyone's um, economic peril. More people like me. Yeah. <laughs> what does the world need now? What does the world need now? Wow, good question. Um, uh, what does the world need now? More understanding. Friendship. Leadership. Um, understanding. A red bird. Yeah. Okay. A red, bird. A red bird. Thank you. That's too complicated. I'm trying to think. What does the world need now? The world needs hope and peace. That's a good question. Peace, love, and harmony. Um. Forgiveness. More weekly newspapers. What do you think the world needs right now? What do you think we need? Um, food. More love. What is that? A, that's a song, right? Love, sweet love. <laughs> <laughs> more communication. Love. It needs more peace, love, and understanding. And it needs to uh, allow what's called Takum Olam, that's Hebrew for the healing of the world. We need to be participating in the healing of the world. Tolerance. I think, uh, gosh, just being genuine and sincere. Cooperation. Just more, honestly, love for each other. That's all. Water. What is it? Okay. Cheese. Cheese. And superheroes. Flowers. I 
think everybody just needs to find common ground and get along, especially in politics. Direction. What does the world need now? <laughs> I don't think I'm interested. Air. Kids that uh, have more respect for their parents and, and society and actually folks getting along. Better economy. I'm going to go with less war. Cookies. Definitely more cookies. If we could, um, we could spread uh, the gospel, Christ, everyone, we could, uh, we could start there. That would help. I agree with everybody in that video. Uh, I don't know if you heard the kid who asked for superheroes. I think that's a good one. Cookies, love, communication, cheese. I'm always for more cheese. What does the world need now? It, well, as I started, do we need more goodness and beauty this year? Well, you know, adding more goodness and beauty to the world as it is is really good. But it's kind of like taking this polluted glass of water, which is really nasty. I made sure of it. Uh, it's polluted, and just adding some goodness and beauty on top. It doesn't take care of the essential pollution that is already there to add more goodness and beauty. It, and boy, have we remembered and been reminded this month as Americans that we have pollution that the world needs to be cleansed of. And I'm not just talking about the environment. We saw the pollution of our world with evil in Connecticut this month. And so forgive me if I'm a bit more serious this Christmas Eve, but I want us to deal with reality, frankly, where we're all living. We can't stick our fingers in our ears and go, you know, Christmas, I just want to feel good in the face of such a monstrous moment and go, la, 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 we just need more good and love and the world will be fine. No, let me get all non-goo-goo dolls on you for just a moment. Kids, can you say goo-goo dolls? Goo-goo dolls. You learned something tonight. There you go. We need someone to deal with evil. We need somebody to deal with death that separates us from loved ones. And the spiritual death that we feel somehow separates us from God. As the little boy said, we need a superhero who has those kinds of unique powers, frankly. Kids, I have a question for you. What town was baby Jesus born in? Bethlehem. Here's a picture of Bethlehem. And Christmas Eve being celebrated there this time last year. And they're celebrating in that very spot tonight. Bethlehem is basically an Arab settled area where a third of the people are Christians. This is the church of the nativity. And it is quite possibly the place where the shepherds heard the announcement we've trumpeted tonight. A savior has been born to you today. It was likely at this very spot. But if you worshipped here on Christmas Eve and then you walked outside of the church you would immediately see the three walls that surround the town of Bethlehem, keeping the Israelis and the Palestinians away from each other, from assaulting one another. And then you remember, oh yeah, right here at the heart of Christmas Town is a wall that's a symbol that we don't just need more goodness, that there's some deep pollution in this world. There's violence and there's death that I need to be solved. There's death in my future that needs solving. I need somebody to do something about that this Christmas. So what does the world need most? Well, some of us live like we think that the greatest need is money. If what we needed most was money, you know what would have been born into the manger that Christmas morning? An economist. Well, according to John Maynard Keynes, you get the supply side thing going and then the demand side. But God didn't send us an economist. In a demographic study of Americans in an area of income similar to Lake Norman people, uh, they said the number one need in people's lives today is leisure and time management. Well, if God thought that our greatest need was leisure and time management, he would have sent Julie, the cruise ship director, from the love boat. That 70s show. But he didn't send Julie. The greatest need is not education because we don't even practice what we already know. The greatest need in the world is not more food. There's enough food in the world to feed everybody ten times over, proving the issue is deeper than that. The problem is selfishness. There's a, because of that, there's a disproportionate distribution of food. What do we need? We need God to rescue us, to save us. And so God knew what the world needed most and what the world needs today. And that's a Savior. And so that's who he sent. A Savior. According to the Goo Goo Dolls song that we just sang, yes, one poor child came and saved this world. 
But Mike, I practice religion. Doesn't that kind of like take care of some of this kind of stuff that are problems in the world? Religion doesn't go far enough. And it certainly does not save us from evil, which we've all become re-aware of. Christians of all people should not be surprised that we live in the midst of a war that's cosmic and human. Religion is just trying to do what we know we should be doing. And everybody here would agree, you know, I probably should be loving God with all my heart, mind, soul, and strength. And you know what else I should be doing? I should be loving my neighbor as myself. I should go do that. Right? We all agree on that. Should is easy to figure out for those who pay attention. Some people call that natural law or conscience. Some people call it the Tao, T-A-O. C.S. Lewis referred to it that way. I, but I traveled to Ireland for a week last summer. And in Ireland, they've built what they call peace walls. That sounds really nice, like a nice addition to our world. Well, let me show you what peace walls are. On one side of the wall is the Catholic neighborhood, and on the other side of the wall is the Protestant neighborhood. Those walls are there to try to keep people, all of who know what they should do, from throwing bombs on one another. Peace walls. I stayed with a Catholic nun whose order has been bombed twice. Catholics, Protestants, brothers in Christ who know what they should do. The problem is not knowing what's right. We know what's right. The problem is brokenness in each and every human spirit that causes a disconnection in our relationship with God and our relationship with others, and it builds out into our world. Time Magazine did a study of the epidemic of brokenness in family relationships in this country. When do we feel that brokenness the most in families? At Christmas. So what does God do? God sends us something born into a manger. Kids, what was it that God sent born in the manger that day? Was it an elephant? No? Was it a, was it a Tonka truck? Was it a Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle? No, it was, what was it? It was a baby. It was Jesus as a baby. A baby is not a display of force and control. God does not bring you or I to forth in a manipulative, forceful way. He came as a baby to save us. A visible commitment of God's involvement and presence and desire to save us. He sent a Savior. Not only is this a Savior for what the world needs, but today, the Scriptures say, in the city of Bethlehem, a Savior has been born for you. It's what you need. I need a Savior. A Savior from what? Flat out from death which is separation from God, from loved ones, and from life. I need a Savior from suffering. I need a Savior from evil to know that it will not have the last word in my life or totally. And after the tragedy this month, do I need to spend any time demonstrating that while, yes, we need as much goodness and beauty in this world as possible, what we most need somebody to do is deal with the badness that manifests itself and what we call evil, suffering, sin, and ultimately death. Only one thing can save you and I from the final triumph of, frankly, evil and death, and that is the Savior sent from God on Christmas morning for this very purpose, Jesus. Because we can't achieve ultimate protection or salvation, like in the face of what's just happened, with more guns or with more gun control. Somebody needs to go work on those things and like figure them out together. Perfect school safety measures, perfect mental health care, better parenting. They're all things that need to be worked on, but they don't meet our greatest, greatest need, which is saving. God sent a savior because he knew that this fallen world and every person in it needed saving. Now, you know what? A lot of this is kind of easy to say because I'm like you. I'm really good at knowing what's wrong with the world and with other people. And you know what? Everybody here has theories about how to solve the fiscal cliff and the violence problems. And we kind of enjoy talking about what's wrong with other people's solutions. But boy, am I really good at burying and denying my own stuff in the face of bad things that are out there. We trivialize, we bury, we deny all of our own stuff. And if we're honest, there's a war zone going on inside of us. I see on television today, people in Egypt throwing rocks at each other. But when work stops, when life gets quiet on a day like today, Christmas Eve, tonight, when stockings are done, 
It all gets quiet. I become all aware all over again. There's not just rock throwing on TV. There's rock throwing in me. There are things inside of me I can't explain or understand. There's a contradiction. There's a warring force. And in the Bible, the Apostle Paul puts it this way. Romans 7, verses 18 and 19. Nothing more human or true has ever been said about us. Romans 7. I have the desire to do what's good and right, but I can't carry it out. I end up doing the very evil I don't wish to do. There's that word, evil. I know what's right, I want to do what's right, but there are forces within me causing me to do things I don't even believe in. Like I'll, I'll go and kind of do, I know what's right, and I'll go work out at the gym, and I'm pretty good about doing that. And then I come home, and I still eat an entire bag of potato chips, an entire container of French onion dip. Mm, yum, that's so good. And what I wanted to do, let's keep that Roman scripture up. What I wanted to do was just eat a few chips after my workout because I was good. But what I actually did was eat the whole stinking thing. And that's okay, but something's even worse is I have the desire, I have the want to do what is good and right and celebrate the differences between my wife and me. Viva la difference, right? But then I struggle to carry that out. And so I do what I don't want to do. And so when we went shopping at North Lake Mall last Friday for Christmas, I got all pouty over our different approach to Christmas shopping and gift giving. It's just different, right? And I got all pouty. And in my head, I'm like, I want to value and love this woman with my words and my actions. But I got pouty, frankly, and unloving and hurtful with my words in a way that said, you should be ashamed for being different from me instead of, let me love you in our difference. I, I couldn't do what I wanted to do. Which provokes this question in me, who will save the world from evil and death? And suffering, but who will also save me from the evil that I do, even though I don't want to do it? My greatest need is a savior. It's what all the, the themes of the great Christmas classics are about. Scrooge, or I'll show you on screen, the Grinch that stole Christmas, my personal favorite still. You're a mean one, Mr. Grinch. That's about me. I just described myself to you. Maybe it's about you too. Your worst Christmas stealer is inside you. There's a force inside of me every day that tries to stop Christmas from coming. Selfishness, hate, greed, lust. And I've got to get honest. I'm powerless against this force that's at war inside of me. I need saving from that. Just like I need saving from forces outside of me. I am what Jesus calls a sinner, very simply. And I need a savior. And so for God to change the world, I need to let him change me first. An economist, a teacher, an entertainer, a cruise ship guide won't change it. But God sent a Savior who changes me, and then I can change my little teeny tiny corner of the world by loving my family and the power of Christ and the people around me, doing good work, caring for the less fortunate sacrificially, and doing that over and over until God sends the Savior a second time and changes it all into the new heavens and the new earth forever where there will be no more loss, no more suffering, no sorrow, no violence, no death. Oh, Lord, come soon for your return. And according to the Goo Goo Dolls song, kids, can you say Goo Goo Dolls again? Can you say it one more time? Goo Goo Dolls. According to the song, everyone's been forgiven now. And that offer has been made, but the Bible says you accept that reality of salvation by saying yes, by faith. But, but now that Jesus, he hasn't just been born, but he grew up, and as our Savior, he died on the cross in place of my death and yours. He suffered on the cross to redeem our suffering. He rose from the dead to conquer your death and mine. And he will come again at the end of history to banish all death, all evil, all violence, and all sin. And we can ask him to defeat all sin and death in each of us right now. And then follow him into his future, knowing we are secure in the palm of his hand. But there's one critical last word in the announcement today, and it's the word today. Today, a Savior has been born for you. And so the question as we end here and go out into our Christmas and set kind of an idling speed for paying attention to God. The question isn't, what have you done with Jesus in the past? 
I kind of believe once. I grew up going to church. One time I shed a little tear in a church service. I felt weepy. You know, it, the question isn't like, what have I done with Jesus in the past? Today, it's not about yesterday. Today, a Savior's been born for you. The Bible tells us it's a gift of salvation for each of us, not yesterday, not tomorrow. So what will you choose to do with Jesus today as you contemplate Christmas and are quiet the next couple of days? It begins here. Jesus said, I stand at the door of your life and I knock. And anyone who hears my voice and opens the door, I'll come into your life, I'll save you, and I'll have an intimate relationship with you, and you will be safe with me forever. Jesus won't force the door open. He won't come with force and manipulation. Each one of us has to get up and invite the Lord of the universe to invade our own life. You make the invitation initially to become a Christian, and then those of us who are Christians, every day the invitation to live with and for Jesus is fresh. Because the problem isn't that we don't know what's right. The problem is brokenness in our relationship with God. And Jesus can change us and heal that brokenness. Change begins here. So invite the gift of God, the Savior, to come into your life. Forgive your sins. Invade your being. Jesus called it the new birth. And that happens when you invite the living presence of Jesus into your very being. And then the presence of Christ in you becomes the God life, the Holy Spirit, constantly birthed out of you back to the world as you live for Him and no longer for self. And that God life in you begins to change us and do in us what we can't do for ourselves. The Grinch got a new heart. The Scrooge, he got a do-over for life. And it's the same for you. We get another chance. Born again is what Jesus called it. And so, before I pray, this is something you can do for yourself tonight, right? As I pray, you can pray along with me. But before I do that, I want to speak to parents for just a moment, because I think there are a few parents in here. <laughs> this is a gift you can give to the children in your life. Yes, the gift of being a mom or a dad with the transforming presence of Christ living in your spirit. But also, parents have asked me this month, how can I make my child feel secure? in light of what's happened. How can they know they will be okay with all of this bad news? Well, I want to say to you, parents, grandparents, uncles, aunts, the most secure place a child can live their life is in the hand of the good God who made them. And Jesus made this promise. He said, all whom I give to my heavenly Father, no one can snatch them out of my hand. That is the most and only secure place for your child in the face of the kind of things that we see in our culture today. Our, uh, our Kid Tropolis ministry um, gave children a chance two Sundays ago to place themselves in the palm of the hand of the Lord and receive salvation from Jesus. And then they gave them this, this little sheet to take home and pray through with their parents like, what did that mean that I prayed that? What does it mean and what do I do now to grow as a Christian? And so parents, I've reproduced this sheet for you from our children's ministry. It's on the tables on your way out. If you would like to take it, you can also download it off of my blog. But what I want to say is you can give your child the gift of offering for them to invite Jesus into their heart tonight to save them from death and evil and them to know that they're safe. You can do that tonight. The Savior who alone makes them safe. And if your child may have prayed that a couple of weeks ago, you can go back over it with them tonight when you get quiet and you're looking at the glow stick that's hopefully still lit, right? Or you can pray it with them and ask them if this is the night. And you can use this another time if it's not. And adults, by the way, because it's simple, it works for us if you're ready to take a step of faith. So you can pick one of these up on your way out if you'd like. Would you bow your head and pray with me, please? As I pray this prayer, if it expresses the desire of your heart, would you let it be your prayer? Heavenly Father, I admit that I am powerless against the contradicting force that wars inside of me. I know what's right. I want to do what's right, God. But so many times I act out the very evil I don't even believe in. And God, it's just easier to talk about the evil that's out there in the world. But God, myself, I've lived with denial. But today I admit I'm a sinner. And I'm powerless over the contradicting force within me. 
And I openly receive your gift of forgiveness in Jesus Christ. And I I celebrate you accepting me as your son, as your daughter. And I invite your Holy Spirit, your presence, Lord, to invade my being and make in me the change that will enable me to be a person living the reflection of Jesus to the world. Jesus, thank you for the day of your birth tomorrow, but even more for the presence of your life and holding on to us and saving us forever because you promised, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Would everyone hold your light stick and get ready? And in a moment, I'm going to tell you to click it. Not yet. Not yet. The lights can go down. John 1, 9 says this. The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. And Jesus said, I have come into the world as a light so that no one who believes in me should live in the darkness. Just the front rows, would you start? All the lights, please, drop. All the lights, just the front rows. Silent night, holy night. Slowly the next row, all is calm, all is bright. Round yon virgin, mother and child. Spread it on back now. Holy infant, so tender and mild. Sleep in heavenly peace. Keep spreading. Sleep in heavenly peace. The back row, silent night. The balcony, holy night. Son of God, love's pure light. Radiant beams from Thy holy face with the dawn of redeeming grace. Jesus, Lord, at thy birth, Jesus, Lord, at thy birth. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. And then he spoke a great mystery. He said, if you put your faith in him, you are the light of the world. Would you stand and let's hold it high and finish our worship together? Joy to the world, the Lord is come. Let earth receive her king. Let every heart. And heaven and heaven and nature sing. He rules the world with truth and grace and makes the nations bloom. The glories of his righteousness and wonders of his love and wonders of his love and wonders wonders of his love let's all say merry christmas to one another merry christmas go in peace friends